Welcome back to the Players Tour Finals, everybody. I'm Ailey Loney alongside Corey Baumeister, and we are going to be rocking this next round between Raphael Levy and Michael Jacob. Corey, would you like to give us any predictions for this match? Well, so far, every single prediction I have made, Alias, I have been wrong. But <laughs> once again, I am going to side with the, sh the main deck Shatter the Sky deck to beat the aggro deck. But we've seen it before. If Raph doesn't see that card, I could easily be wrong again. I got Raph Levy. All right. Well, let's jump into this match, everybody. Let's find out if the commentators curse, kind of. I don't know. It's kind of like an inverse curse that you've got going yes. here. So uh, let's see. Who comes out on top in this do or die match? Just a reminder, everybody, whoever loses this, their tournament is over and done. So everything to fight for here as we take a look at the opening hands. Two Birth of Miletus, Mystical Dispute, and a copy of Yorin in hand. Not too shabby. Yeah, not bad at all. Yeah, a lot on the line here. You would lose and you're done. Just two quick matches and you're out of this top eight. That's got to definitely feel bad. Uh, so a huge match for both of them. So we're going to get things underway here. Both players with pretty decent looking opening hands. Michael's yeah. got some early action there with Raise the Alarm into a Woe Strider. Venerated Loxodon to get things going. So from Raph's side, he's definitely going to be wanting to find that Shadow of the Sky to uh, just take care of this battlefield from Michael's side. Yeah, I feel like we can put our voices on repeat and just keep mm -hmm. saying, OK, now he really needs Shatter the Sky because that <laughs> is going to be the story of the game, similar to uh, when Raph Levy played against Riku. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, though, he does have the Birth of Miletus. You know, the 0-4 walls are very good blockers against this uh, this deck. You know, these little yeah. one ones, sure, they can get a few points of damage in here and there. But uh, once those walls come down, uh, at least Raph's face will be safe from the Fiori that is this Marty Winota list until, of course, Winota herself shows up to the party. Exactly. I was just going to say the exact same thing. These walls are great when Michael Jacob is playing a fair game, but whenever <laughs> he puts on that very unfair card, it doesn't matter if you can chump block a couple of the tokens. The The value that you get generated from Winota overpowers those tokens real quickly. For sure. So taking a look here at Raph's hand, Three Fabled Passages. It's a little clunky. Yeah. Would like to get uh, Narset going sooner rather than later just to start digging through the library. But uh, what's his what's his plan of action here? I think you have one choice here, I guess, too, because you can play a Birth of Miletus first, but you can't cast Narset right now and mm -hmm. you do want to protect yourself against Winota. So yeah. I wouldn't be shocked to see a Plains and hold up Dispute, but Raphael Levy just saying, yeah, you know what? If you got Lan Winota, <laughs> GG, we can move yeah. on. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> Well, currently Michael has neither of those things, so uh, we'll have to see what he draws off the top as uh, we're going to deploy the Fabled Passage. And go find some blue here for Raph Levy. There is Winota. Hello, my Ooh. dear. Unfortunately, Ooh. though, no fourth land. Exactly. And I mean, Raphael Levy is definitely going to be rewarded uh, for his play here just because holding up Dispute next turn is going to be much more effective if oh, Michael yeah. Jacob top decks the land. Uh, but even this battlefield right here is going to get the job done pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, I was just about to say, you know, Winota or not, there's four creatures on the battlefield, one of which deals extra damage if things do die. So, uh, yeah. yeah, the onus is here on Raph Levy again and the Narset, you know, giving it a bit of a whirl, being like, all right, please find me something or are we going to hang on to this dispute? Yeah, it's brutal because just trying to react to whatever Michael Jacob plays, MJ could do something like just, you know, not playing anything or play something like Woe Strider that he doesn't really care if it gets countered, even if he draws mm -hmm. that fourth land and just kind of dance around the limited things that Raphael can actually interact with. And if you just don't play your Winota until Raphael has to tap out for something powerful, then you're just going to win with it eventually. <laughs> All right, Winota threatening to come on down. Narset finding Elspeth Conqueror's Death and Glass Casket. Yeah. Those are pretty good cards, you know, if we were just dealing with a single threat at a time. But this battlefield, like you mentioned, Corey, is just getting ever larger <laughs> the longer yeah. this game goes on. This is getting rough. I feel like you just have to take Elspeth Conqueror's Death, kind of pray that... Uh... 
you know, MJ just doesn't have the land Winota play and you can just start Elspeth conquering death, locks it on, and then do the very powerful play that we haven't seen from Raphael Levy yet in this uh, day three event. And that's just blinking anything with Yorian. And when you don't do that in your Yorian control deck, it feels bad, but there we go. Here we go. Let's see some fireworks, please. We found the swamp. There's Winota. All in with the team. We're going to get three triggers. What do we find at the top of the library? Is this GG here for Michael Jacob in game number one? Oh, well, let's man. See. Show me, show me, show me. I want to see what they're finding. <laughs> Looking across the table and seeing multiple Winota triggers uh -huh. when you're already behind on board is one of the most frustrating things ever. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Hello, Kitesail Freebooter. Gonna take a look in your hand there. Oh, what a nice little glass casket. Give me that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right looks one like more we, trigger. Looks like we did miss on the first mm -hmm. trigger. Uh, so already, Raph Levy is, you know, got to be pretty happy with that. With <laughs> only getting three triggers um, and only hitting a redundant Winota and Freebooter, that's about as good as you can hope for. Yeah. But Raph yeah. is still very far behind. Oh, for sure. I mean, sometimes this deck does whiff, but uh, yeah, getting a pretty good swing in here. Four creatures going unblocked. Kitesail Freebird is going to chip down away at that Narset, surrendering it useless, essentially, just uh, hanging out there at one loyalty. And down to five goes Raph Levy. Do or die time, sir. And it looks like we might be a little bit dead. Yeah, it looks like die instead of do, that's for sure. I think <laughs> Raph is uh, doing a little bit of posturing here. MJ uh, maybe sensing the humor a little bit, but yeah, this game is uh, toast. <laughs> yeah, MJ is very animated. It's quite fun to see. <laughs> you can just see he's canning himself. He's enjoying this. I mean, why wouldn't you enjoy this? My Winota just resolved and I got two things on the battlefield. So yes, please, I'm happy. Please yeah. just punch Michael Jacob picking up that first win. Yeah, you gotta love being in the aggressive side in a tournament <laughs> where, you know, the best decks are like Team of Reclamation and those kind of mirrors. The aggressive side, and similar to what Christopher Larson was saying, is just being able to play the decks they know that are maybe a little easier to play than Reclamation mirrors. It feels a lot more of a relaxed environment uh, than just jamming, you know, 20 turn <laughs> games back and forth. For sure. I, I, I do. Uh, I do like the more aggressive strategy it does feel like yeah. you're just like okay i'm gonna try the thing if the thing doesn't work let's go to the next game you know it's not these <laughs> long drawn out matches where you have to invest so much brain power to try and you know get the littlest of edges it's either you win or you lose cool let's go Exactly. I'm kind of somewhere in between because whenever, you know, you're doing well with an aggro deck, you're like, OK, this is so fun. But then whenever you just have no chance in a game with an aggro deck, you're like, I really wish I could control my destiny a little bit more and play like a team of reclamation mirror. <laughs> so it's a it's a give and take, I feel. For sure. So just a reminder to everyone here, Raphael Levy needs to win this next game or he is out. Michael Jacob is fighting to get back into this tournament. Uh, to get to the the grand finals, in essence, we'll see uh, the lower finals, the upper finals, and then the uh, championship battle right at the end of today. Yes. But uh, still plenty of magic to happen before then as we get ready for game number two here between Michael Jacob and Raphael Levy. Exactly. Yeah. Win or go home, or I guess you're already at home, so go yeah. to your couch. Yeah. But winner, winner goes to play Christopher <laughs> Larson after this. And you got to look at the matchup here between Mardu or Azoria's control up against Chris. Maybe not a great matchup for either Michael Jacob or Raphael Levy, but at least you would be still in it and have a chance to continue. Mm -hmm. Both players, though, focusing on this matchup. We got to get there. There, out of the sky. I was wondering if this card <laughs> that we've been talking about the whole time actually existed. Was it in this list? And yes, yes, it is. There, out of the sky. So Raph Levy, got to be happy to see that. Yeah, no kidding. After This is the fourth game we've seen from Raphael <laughs> Levy this morning. And that is the first shatter of the sky we have seen it, at all, even, you know, late into the game, he has just not seen it and he's been only playing against aggressive decks. So that's got to be frustrating for the Hall of Famer. I am having such a good time just watching Michael Jacob. He's so animated. Like he kind of <laughs> did the, Wee? you know, this is kind of a right. But I mean, this hand looks very good. Yes, yes. I do I like love uh, tuning into Michael Jacob's stream. One of the best sealed players of all time. And I, I learn a lot whenever I whenever I watch his stream. Nice. I shall have to frequent it myself, but yes. uh, just deciding what he wants to send back here. It looks like we're going to send back a planes. 
liking the look of the rest of the cards, the playables in there. So uh, got to be hoping to find some land off the top of the library. Finds a Woe Strider. Not what he wanted to see, most likely, but uh, still a very, very powerful hand indeed if he does hit his land drops. Agreed. Yeah, and I like that uh, put back from Michael Jacob. That is a deck that just really, Marty Winota is a deck that just really has no flood protection. So mm -hmm. whenever you draw too many lands, you just drew too many lands. There's not <laughs> much you can do. It doesn't, not every card redraws itself, like in the Team of Reclamation decks, like what you get is what you got. <laughs> <laughs> Finds raise the alarm, is able to deploy that on an end step of ref levies, but opts to go for the little Lazatep Reaver, generating that zombie token and uh raf's just gotta get himself to four mana and then he can start deploying his own threats if he decides to go for the archon of sun's grace or if the battlefield needs a clearing we can do that we're gonna see yorion sky nomad brought to hand from the companion zone is it a land it is all right so we got temple of silence so michael's gonna give it a little scry try find land number four and try to get a really really powerful winota turn Hey, you found exactly. land. Exactly. And there is land number four. We have raised the alarm to set up. Now, Raphael Levy with seeing a scry to the top. You just have to be focused on, okay, Winota is probably coming next turn. Mm -hmm. So what is the best way to prevent a lot of triggers? And, you know, we have been saying over and over and over again that Shatter the Sky is this card that is just absolutely amazing in this matchup. If we go for Shatter Ooh. right here, it doesn't even feel very good mm -mm. because then we're going to get two Winota triggers from those Raise the Alarm tokens. Yeah, and that's the thing that Raph's got to be, you know, contemplating now or thinking about. It's like, okay, two untapped mana. Do you have Raise the Alarm? Because then now the Shatter the Sky is not great, but at least then you're only dealing with two triggers and not four. Oh, all right. So gusting time. Exactly. And I mean, here we get to see gust and we look at, you know, Michael Jacob has the information of open deck list and mm -hmm. just sees that like mystical disputes are probably not in post board. So the only way to deal with these Winotas is just to keep gusting them. And that's yeah. never actually dealing with the threat. So, I mean, you just jam whenever you can. I, I love that mentality from Michael Jacob here. Yeah, but this is also a really, really good turn now for Raph, who's able to oh, prevent yeah. any Winota triggers. Just Shadow of the Sky, everything dies. <laughs> sure, you get your Winota back, but now you have no triggers. So this is the part where Michael gets to rebuild the battlefield, selfless savior down, followed by the War Strider, and things will live. Even with the second copy of Shadow of the Sky in hand, he'll still have something left on the battlefield here to trigger Winota. So Raph, you got to find something. Exactly. And I mean, you look at uh, Raphael Levy's options right now, you could shatter. But right now, the Winota's face up. Raph knows he has to play around that. If you shatter, I mean, you get to keep Woe Strider alive with the selfless savior, selfless savior and you can <laughs> uh, uh, scry with that goat. But I mean, that's still a Winota trigger coming in. I mean, that's not insane, but it's your second shatter. You don't have another one. So you really got to use that last one with extreme caution. Yeah. A little unfortunate here to find the tap land. If he had found an untapped land, could have gone with Archon of Sun's Grace into the Birth of Miletus, getting that extra Pegasus down on the battlefield just to, you know, gain mm -hmm. some extra life, uh, prevent some extra damage. But alas, that is not the case, so... Yeah, and even we going for the if shatter? we had that alias V, mm -hmm. it's just brutal. Like, you have two flyers, but now you're facing down three Winota triggers. Like, <laughs> I, I don't even know if you're ahead if you put Archon in play and have a 2-2. Two -two. Like, it, it still feels really bad. That just yeah. shows the resiliency of this Mardu Winota deck um, and just the annoyance of all these creatures, really. <laughs> <laughs> yep, selfless savior. Now you're now you're giving me tongue twisters. I almost called it a shellfish savior. That's not it. <laughs> Selfless savior protecting the lower strider, which is gonna scry with the little goat token. So in essence, the shadow of the sky didn't really do a whole heck of a lot. Sure, there's two less creatures, but we still have the woe strider. We get a scry. We get to show up our draws and possibly get to jam a Winota here. Exactly. All well, that shadow see. was was two less Winota triggers, which is huge. But... That is huge. Yes. And here we go. Spin and oh, nothing. Whiff. Oh, whiff. Oh, brutal. <laughs> All right. He's unhappy about that, but Raph is super pleased indeed. You can see Michael Jacobs' face. is like, oh, drat. <laughs> nice. All right. So now we get to get a few little ponies in the sky. Get an extra blocker off of the birth of Miletus. 
Yeah, I don't know if drat was the first word that he had in his mind. Probably but, not, uh... <laughs> but it's it's the broadcast friendly four letter word. Of course, yes, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, this board, this battlefield is a lot more manageable now. And if you miss again off Winota mm -hmm. and you attack with that woe strider into a three four, all of a sudden it it feels extremely yeah. bad. It feels like Ref is very much taking control of this matchup now with Yorin in hand too. He's able to bounce that birth of Melitas, get a creature off of it as well and yeah. uh, get extra creatures in the sky. So this is going to be a tricky, tricky situation for uh, Michael Jacob to get out of as he's still not finding his lands. You know, he's he's got gas in hand, but he hasn't got he hasn't got land number five yet. Doesn't have that very many outs to deal with mm -hmm. Yorion. So now it's just like, all right, do or die. Let's go, Winota, to find us something. I wonder if this is just going to be a pure setup turn or if we keep the foot on the gas because you can go freebooter, locks it on, you know, put a counter on all three of your creature and yeah. set up for something bigger. Or you just go pedal on the gas and just hope yeah. to do what your deck does. And I think I like that Ooh, better. And it looks like he's getting nice. maximally paid off for that decision. That was huge. Nice. Hitting Basri's Lieutenant, getting Judith down two, making these creatures able to punch through the Archon of Sun's Grace if they do block and Basri now putting counters on the Woe Strider as well. So if that mm -hmm. does die, we get another creature off of that. And those creatures also trigger Winota. So very, very good find there for Michael. Agreed. And I mean, the one sad thing for Michael Jacob fans right here is this Winota does not really have a way to live. Even if that Lieutenant put a counter on Winota, the Archon of Sun's Grace and the Pegasus does still take it down. So. Yeah. Michael Jacob is trying to diversify the threats as much as possible and just make sure Winota is a must answer threat, but now yeah. everything else is building as well and becomes scary threats as well. Well, hang on here. That's nine damage if we double block Winota. Judith triggers. We, that's a very, very scary position to be in. We need to answer this, Judith, or we're just dead to her death trigger pings. Yeah. Not right now, but soon. But eventually, yeah. But uh, we are going to gain five life from Raphael yes, Levy's side. So it's interesting. Yeah, it, and that's a really nice counter to put for Michael Jacob onto the mm -hmm. Wostrider. Because the Winota, if you double block with those two creatures, the last ping from Judith still takes down both creatures here. Mm. Mystical Dispute is actually not a bad pickup. No. Oh, wow. Reaching right for the Thirst of Meaning is pretty scary. Just saying, I'm in Shatter the Sky number three mode already. How did this, how did I get to this spot, you know? <laughs> With having two Shatter the Skies already resolve in this, in this game. It's just crazy to see Michael Jacob <sighs> replenish right. so quickly. Thirst for Meaning and Thirst for Answers is what Raph is feeling right now. He needs to find a way to deal with Judith. Oh, just the whole battlefield. This is really, really tricky. Yeah. Oh, this is brutal. This is brutal because Archon of Sun's Grace, if it was a good enough body, just playing huh? that with Mystical Dispute up seems great. But did okay. find the Brazen okay. Borrower, so Petty Theft can can take Winota out of the picture. Currently, we just have the one trigger off of the Knight token, which isn't a human, surprisingly. Must be an elf hiding out underneath that helmet. <laughs> Yes, you gotta love the the random creature types that these <laughs> Mardu Winota decks throw in there. All right. All right, this is a large Ooh. attack coming back. And I mean, we have Petty Theft for combat to stop this Winota, but once again, these are just band-aids. These are not yeah. these are not solutions. Not at all, as we see Cutsail Freebooter coming on down. Raph is not happy about it. Look at his face. Yeah. To dispute or not to dispute, that is the question. But then we can't do anything else. And yeah, we'd love to get Brazen Borrower. So do we, in response, do we Brazen Borrow here? I mean, you don't have to respond to the Freebooter because the Freebooter cannot take Brazen Borrower because it's technically True. a creature. So that one's kind of safe. But yeah, I mean, Brazen Borrow is the only thing you can do to just keep yourself alive in this situation. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can so jump Tony Winota and take six seven eight nine but then you're at two then a shatter of the sky you're dead to judas triggers so that's not a that's not a solution either here mm -mm. answer cut sale freebooter <laughs> gonna take a look grabs a mystical dispute nothing else he can grab as petty theft is safe being on the creature 
just looking at Michael Jacobs' camera right now, he is just <laughs> He's so having a great animated. Time. He is just having a blast, and it, it is uh, uh, pretty fun to watch, I must say. <laughs> All right, what do we send back here? <laughs> Gotta be Winota, right? I mean... Yeah, it's the biggest thing on the battlefield. Maybe you send back Judith and hope to draw Shatter so that even if they bring in other... Even if Winota triggers and brings in other stuff, it's just more things that die to a Wrath. Mm -hmm. But you could just die. So that... This is yeah, cool. it looks like it might just be the just die option here for uh, Wrath Levy, but not lethal just yet. And why wouldn't we get this Judith into combat? I wouldn't see a reason not to. That... Mm -mm, no. What? Nevertheless, though, two creatures swinging on in. We know it will be blocked by the wall. Four points of damage coming through. So we're going to go down to seven. I'm wondering what I'm missing there, because you, you think Raphael Levy has to chump block there. It just seems like a free two damage. Is there a mm -hmm. reason why? Uh, OK, there we go. There we go. All right. You wanted it to lock it on to level up. <laughs> level up. <laughs> All right. right. That's How where you, you hit the your go emote and say, yeah. good luck, Raph. How the heck do you deal with this battlefield? Goodness me. I don't me. think you can. No, I you can't, because can. even if there is a board wipe here, Bowser Jutan just says, oh, hey, look at all my knight tokens. Oops, you're dead. Not even that. It's just the selfless saver will save one creature, and then if the rest of the creatures die, that's still five damage to the face. Like, mm -hmm. then you just save what you save Winota, and then you attack for the last four points. I, I think this is stone cold over. Yep, I'm going to agree with you there, Corey, as uh, Raph just takes a look at his hand, ruining the Navyorion's hanging out in there, unable to help him stay alive in this. Archon of Sun's Grace is a great creature, but he would have loved to have had that down with a bunch of other enchantments and constellation triggers just to fend off against this onslaught here from Michael Jacob, who seems very, very pleased with uh, with his deck's performance. Yeah, this is just unreal. Think about this, Alias. Raphael Levy played against the two aggressive decks as the first two rounds, exactly what he wants to be paired against, and he has not won a game. A nope. game. Not a single game. That is just unreal. And just shows <sighs> how talented these players are uh, that are playing against him. <laughs> now we're just making sure we can do all the things we can possibly do. Whoa, Strider escapes from the graveyard. We're going to see a big old button being hit. Every single creature going to swing into the red zone. And Michael Jacob is going to win this lower round in the finals of the Players Tour. First, let's Impressive see what we find on the top stuff. of the library. Oh, hey, look, more Basri's lieutenants. <laughs> oh, my. Just an embarrassment of riches at this point. Now, <laughs> MJ just gets to show off a little bit. Yep, it's like, look, I still had all these. <laughs> <laughs> but what about a Brazen Borrower? Take that. <laughs> no, me and Brazen Borrower is fine. We can jump in the way of something here, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's so many attackers here. I don't and even just, think it matters at this point. Not really. And then just another story of Brazen Borrower having to be left in in this matchup, just because when you play 80 cards, there's not enough good stuff to bring in. You always have these few dead cards. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it doesn't matter because Azoria's control does draws so many cards and either wins by a mile or loses, you know, yeah. and it's not really close, so uh, but just brutal. Yeah. Bad beats there for Rath Levy, unfortunately. His tournament is over. Congratulations to Michael Jacob. Mardu Winota gets it done. Certainly a Mardu and not a Mar. Don't, right, Corey? <laughs> very nice, very nice joke there, Elias. <laughs> yeah. Congrats to MJ. That is so awesome to see him take it down with, you know, Mardu Winota, the only person that played it in this entire event. Well, we have an interview ready with him right now, so let's go and hear from our Mardu hero. I'm here with Michael Jacob, who has just vanquished Raphael Levy in very convincing circumstances. You've got to be happy with that win there, MJ. Yeah, yeah, I think Raph got some pretty poor draws. I didn't have a two-drop either game, but uh, he did draw, draw a several shatter this guy's game too, so maybe it wasn't that bad. I don't know, I didn't see from his perspective how to watch the, then watch the VOD. Well, look, anyway, you slice it was certainly a very, very triumphant win with a deck that I don't think anyone saw coming. Your wild, wild Madu Winota brew, you must be very, very happy having uh, chosen it for this tournament. 
Uh, yeah, actually, one of the reasons I uh, I chose this deck is that it reminded me so much of Etherworks Marvel. Because you know, you look at the top six, play a card without playing the yeah. mana cost, but and uh, instead of playing Mobile First Pulse Knot, I'm playing Raise the Alarm. It's the same deck. <laughs> <laughs> the old the old spin to win has uh, treated you very well so far, MJ. Yeah. Well, Listen, I next up it's Christopher Larson. I can't all be winners. Next up it's Christopher Larson on Jun Sacrifice. How are you feeling about this matchup? Uh I think the matchup is pretty decent outside of Mayhem Devil. I got a lot of cards like Woe Strider and Selfless Savior that are kind of just not good against Mayhem Devil. So hopefully they just don't draw it. That's the plan. It's worked right. so far. Well, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, if that, if the plan is just fade stuff in your opponent's deck, oh, well, yeah. sometimes it works out for you. MJ, listen, mate, very well done so far. The win's certainly back in your sails now after that win. Uh, congratulations on making it so far, and the very best of luck to you in the uh, for the rest of the tournament. Thanks. I love that plan from Michael Jacob. Just hope that Christopher Larson doesn't draw Mayhem Devil because that's the card that really, really hurts his strategy. Makes sense. All right, well, we will see those games very shortly, friends. We're going to take a short commercial break, and we'll see you on the other side of this with more magic. Two extremely experienced players here. Of course, Kai Booty, one of the most celebrated players we've ever had in Magic the Gathering, having won seven Pro Tours. It's a it's a unfathomable number at this point unlikely to ever be eclipsed or even close to it and sitting across from him Shoti Asoka one of the most respected players in the game absolutely he's no slouch himself we just have two hall of famers actually just going at it you know kind of the old school players who've been playing the game for quite some time but proving that they still have it here you know still alive deep into Mythic Championship 3. Shota won a pro tour back in the day a couple years ago Shota is losing permanence, and they're not coming back. And just just additional insurance here. Oath of Kaya off the top, meaning Kaya now can just fire it off and sit at a comfortable five life here and not have to worry about a potential series of Oath of Kaya's that Shota could draw. Wow, incredible from Kai Buda. Anybody who doubted him coming into the tournament is surely a fool as he is going to stay alive for yet another round in miraculous fashion as well now he's just adding on he's got oath of kaya oath of kaya plus ugin and this one is going to be in the books <laughs> i can't believe that kai found a win here i mean he had to top deck two perfect cards in yeah, a row the to rest and the elder spell no no it was command the dread horde oh you're into right to the elder spell you're right with to the, set that up to set that whole thing up Unbelievable game and a real pleasure to watch. Search for his Kanta is too little too late. Shota says good game and Kai Buddha earns the victory. He will survive to fight another day. It is the finals and it is getting Real exciting down there. This one was looking like it was going to be over. One, two, three punch for uh, Taralf Zevran from Germany, but not so quickly, says Alvaro uh, Fernandez Torres. He was mulligan to five, down two games in the sideboarded games, and somehow found a great draw and a win in game number three. It is now two games to one in favor of Severin. He's calm and cool. He's looking through. He, he got exactly what he needed to combat this excellent draw from Alvaro Fernandez Torres. Can he finish? He has Walking Ballista. He has Walking Ballista. So I think that's it. I think that just... Does that, he have enough mana? I think, well, he's not going to win right now. But like I said, Torres needed land plus Ballista over the course of the next two turns. And this should lock it up, right? Because if You're he draws right. land, he's not going to have the Ballista. So I think Torres just has it here. There it is, a 5-5 walking ballista, and there's really no way out here for Alvaro Fernandez Torres. It was simply too much from Taralf Zevran over the course of this match. Alvaro fought hard, he fought long, but he is way too far behind to come back now. And surely Zevran is on the brink of victory here in Barcelona. He's thinking about a card he could draw, but Damping Sphere certainly isn't it. And that's going to do it. You have your champion, <laughs> Toralf Zeverin. He looks over at his cheering section, and he's your champion. Oh, my goodness. One damage. He got down to one. 
life. And he survives, turns it around. Ulamog exiling two key permanents in two of these games. And his friends are mobbing him. Look at that. Riley gave him a kiss on his head. They're all so excited friends. for Tonrao <laughs> Zeverin. <laughs>Welcome back to the Players Tour Finals, everybody. I'm Ailey Loney, that is Corey Baumeister, and we are going to jump into our very next matchup. But before we do, let's go and hear from Ben Whites. I'm here with Ben Whites, who finished top of the Swiss with four color reclamation. Congratulations, Ben. Must be uh, must feel excellent to have had such a, a strong performance during the, uh, the Swiss portion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, top eating a Pro Tour has been like a goal of mine for about four or five years now, so I'm really happy to finally, you know, check that one off the bucket list. Reclamation Strategies obviously dominated the Swiss there, but you picked a variant of it that really, really overperformed. You must have been very, very happy with your deck choice. It really worked out for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, Four Color Reclamation did really, really well, like uh, even amongst just my teammates, like we had a bunch of people near the top of the standings. Um, I chose it because it was like very favored, in my opinion, in the Reclamation Mirror. Teferi and Dove, and actually Dovin's Veto, I think, being even more important than Teferi, uh, just being really powerful trumps in the mirror. Um, and the it's worse against aggro, but not like that much worse. You're obviously not too bad if you've uh, if you've managed to snag top, top spot on the Swiss there. You've got a week to prepare for the upcoming top eight. Uh, I'm interested to hear how what your week next week looks like. Uh, what you, where your head's at? Are you feeling confident? Have you even thought about the top eight taking place next week? Talk us through your, your headspace right now. Yeah, I haven't thought about that at all, to be honest. Uh, I'm in the the mindset where like I just hit one of my goals, and I'm like, oh my god, thank god, like I did this thing. I'm so happy. It's so great. Um, that feels really far away for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. took off work last week to sort of prepare for this tournament, so I'm probably not going to take any more. And yeah, I'll probably, you know, try to get some focus testing with a teammate um, against some of the weirder decks. Well, look, it sounds like you're in a great spot, certainly flying high this weekend. So congratulations. Thanks very much for joining us and the very best, best of luck to you next week. Ben White's in the top eight. Yeah, thanks a lot, Riley. All right, now let's hear from Patrick Fernandez, his opponent. I'm with Patrick Fernandez, who has made it through to the top eight this weekend. And oh my goodness me, look at the smile on your face. Mate, you must be feeling fantastic. What was your tournament experience like? Was it in line with your expectations? Yeah, I felt like it would be mostly mirrors and or growth fire decks, like Bent Ramp or maybe Sultai Ramp. And I ended up facing, I think, Mardu Inota and uh, Bono Green that didn't play growth Spiral. But I think my list was really well set up for that metagame, like with more Spectral Sailors, with uh, Narcissus Reversal, Commencement Game Main Deck. I think I had the tools for, for, for that metagame. Well, uh, it's unusual this week because, of course, our top eight takes place a week after the actual event to qualify. What, what are you going to do in this week? You've got uh, six or seven days to prepare yourself. So what does this week look like for you? Uh, I'm gonna rest a bit. I'm gonna take like Monday off of Magic, I think. And then I'm gonna get up with some friends. We're gonna take a look at the lists that are going to be in the top eight and then like just play the, the whole week uh, as many matchups I, as I can get. Probably if there are like a lot of mirrors, then lists are not absurdly different from each other. So uh, we can optimize time during the testing. Well, you've already said you've, you've got a couple of friends to help you out there. Is there anyone else you want to thank? Anyone anyone you want, you want to shout out or, or say thank you to after this huge result for you, mate? First, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for my sponsor, uh, Bazaar Gaming. Whoop, Bazaar Gaming. They <laughs> believed in me. Also, I want to give a shout out to the Skype Discord Portuguese testing group. The, those guys helped me level up my game a lot, especially for this tournament, uh, Marcio Carvalho. Bernardo Torres and uh, Carlos Romão. Well, mate, listen, congratulations. A huge result for you. You must be very happy. And uh, once again, well done. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, Riley. It was a pleasure. All righty. Well, we are ready to jump in here between these two players. This match 
They are up a game apiece. So we're going to join them on game number three. So let's get right into the action. And uh, let's see if Patrick can make his very vocal fans in chat even happier. They're going absolutely mad right now, Corey. Yeah, no kidding. Patrick's got quite the fan base. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, the Brazilian community is so close knit. So it makes they sense uh, uh, that he's got such a following. So good for him. All right, well, let's see if that energy can get him through this matchup here. It is the Reclamation face-off. I don't know what we want to call it, but uh, can't, can't easily call it a mirror match considering uh, the addition of Kenrith and Vitos and Teferi's from Benjamin's side, can we? Exactly, not really. And we almost saw the huge detriment to the four-colored list right away if that breeding pool wasn't on top. Ben kept mm -hmm. hand without green, but Ooh, threw yeah. it right away uh, and all the problems seemed to be over. <laughs> Problem solved. You just gotta believe, right? Exactly. In the cleave? No, no, that cleave didn't no, do no, that no, well. No, 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 yeah. no. Cleave, cleave is. We don't talk about cleave in this uh, this weekend. He did not show up at all. Not at all. Uh, both players just getting things set up quite nicely here. We've got growth spirals and rows are plenty from both players. That's something that you'll definitely see from both of these uh, these deck lists. Just being able to ramp, get those extra lands down on the battlefield and try and get to Reclamation before your opponent does so. Uh, that card, though, is not in hand here for either player, so exactly. let's see what, how this shakes out. And I mean, that is the name of the game here, and that is why these Reclamation decks are so powerful. The early game is just spent using these ramp spells that, oh, just happen to draw an extra card as they ramp. It is just so <laughs> powerful the ability for Gross Spiral and Uro to, you know, not only cycle through your deck and find the cards you need, like Wilderness Reclamation, Expansion, Explosion, but also ramp you so you can do your powerful Commence the Endgame, Giant Sharks, or Kenrith in Ben's uh, case. Yep, and uh, three mana left open there. Ben doesn't want any of that, just sends the turn back. Growth Spiral on the end step. Let's get some more lands down. And there is a breeding pool for Patrick, who has a commence the end game at his disposal, as well as the Brazen Borrower slash Petty Theft. One thing I loved about Patrick's interview too, just recognizing the pure power of the unbeatable Spectral Sailor. Just saying, I played two of those, so I feel really advantage in the mirror. That has mm -hmm. been my experience as well, Patrick. So I am loving that he said that. Oh yeah, <laughs> Spectral Sailor is just such a good card because, you know, these decks don't play cheap removal. It's like, okay, I need to uh, explode that Spectral Sailor for five mana just to get it off the battlefield. That's not what you want to do. It's yeah. a one mana card, but it's a one mana card that gets you right back into things if you manage to draw and uh, can keep it alive and keep it out of the yeah. jaws of very angry sharks. Exactly. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to play on like, turn. you know, when you have about five mana through nine mana, that kind of middle mm -hmm. ground before you start dropping haymakers like commence the end game, giant sharks, yeah. start going for wilderness reclamation when you have three mana open that middle ground it's really just land go and just trying to make sure you hit land drops but with spectral sailor it's just draw a card when you have nothing to do oh well here's something to do commence the end game generating this little four four it's not the biggest token we could possibly find but uh, it's still a pretty big pain in the backside here for ben as it's going to chip away at the life total until we can get kenrith down or a big old shark spectral sailor off of the commence the end game so likely to see that come out relatively soon when the opportunity presents itself, which is right now if he wants to. Does he go for it? Oh, I mean, you just got to. Like, what What deals with it? You know, I mean, like, <laughs> it's just unbeatable. I, I think at some point, the <laughs> sailor is just going to take it down. Can you tell I love this card, Alias? I can tell, yes, <laughs> yes. You're just like, no, no, none of these other cards are as good as the Spectral Sailor. You heard it here first, Spectral Sailor MVP. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And funny enough, right now, Ben Weitz does not have access to red mana, except for that Triome that uh -huh. we just uh, drew. And, you know, I mean, that just leads to some problems. And the, the funny dynamic right now where Ben played something that he probably did not want to tap on on his turn, what these, like, four fours from Commence the Endgame do it just makes your opponent blink first. Spectral yeah. Sailor does the exact same thing. When you have that on the field, 
you are so incentivized if you're playing against it to start trying to jam stuff because not only are you allowing your opponent to not use their mana to draw a card but you're forcing them to answer your threats and if they can't answer them they don't get to tunnel all that mana into spectral sailor yeah um but you know tapping out on your turn we see it so often the person who taps out first usually is really disadvantaged in the game well, speaking of tapping out, we might see that from both players here. As Spectral Sailor was on the stack, Mystical Dispute lands, and we don't see Patrick pay the three for it. Clever, Interesting. clever. Interesting. I, I would feel you would value that and make them use the second dispute there, but you can tell Patrick is really prioritizing getting the game finished and add yep. another body to uh, the battlefield here. Yeah, the longer this game goes, the scarier it gets because, you know, we can see our Wilderness Reclamation explosion out of nowhere from both players. So I love this, you know, just put foot and go because there is nothing that Ben Whites can do right now with, you know, three mana available for a potential mystical dispute. Uh, so let's just jam our biggest creatures and go. Yeah, and and to be honest, I think uh, I, I didn't love not paying for the dispute because a 2-2 two -two shark doesn't match up great against, well, your opponent's 2-2 two -two shark. If you leave <laughs> that in turn to just make a giant one, that is another must-answer threat. Right now, the 2-2 two -two is already answered, and basically the result would have been Ben would have just lost that other dispute. Spectral Sailor would have got countered, but that's another card that would have been out of Ben's hand. Here we see Uro Titan on Nature's Wrath on the stack, attempting to make an escape at Mystical Dispute. The uh, Warden in this situation, trying to keep him at bay, is paid for. And here we're going to see a few more cards drawn, but Petty Theft in hand, able to send back this uh, Titan. There is a Mystical Dispute in hand, but Negate at the ready to counter anything from Ben's side of things. Yeah, looking pretty Oof. rough here for Ben fans mm -hmm. out there. I mean, we have the mystical dispute to deal with this brazen borrower. Patrick correctly and very smartly does not tap out for it, saying, hey, these mystical disputes lose a ton of value as oh, long yeah. as I don't walk into them. So really nice no play from that brazen borrower <laughs> from Patrick. Very, very good uh, read of the situation there as we see the team swing in here. 10 points of damage getting through the Sharks trade off. And all of a sudden, Ben Whites is down to five with not much going for him. Had a new row, it got bounced. Doesn't have a graveyard full of things to bring it back again. He does have a handful of counter spells, one of which is not that great, though. So you've got to think that uh, we're going to see a victory very shortly here for Patrick Fernandez if things keep progressing the way they are. Yeah, definitely, but this game is not over for Ben. Ben has a lot more action. We have mm -hmm. the gust to deal with Uro, so if this negate gets pointed at Wilderness Reclamation, for instance, now we can kind of untap our mana. Dovin's Veto, play Uro, untap, use your mana yeah. there. I mean, this is not over yet. Um, not at all. Not by a long shot. Act Actually, as I say that, this Brazen Bar, I think, is going to be lethal. We can get Uro down again, though, correct? Yeah, we can get Uro up to eight. Yep, okay, up to eight. And so then we're up the four, to eight. four plus the Brazen Borrower will be seven. So we're still alive <laughs> if we're Ben here. Live. Barely. So Barely. Ben needs to find something off the top of the in the next turn or two. Maybe a massive explosion. Something along those lines to get him back into this. He needs to deal with these threats in the battlefield, first and foremost. So he's going to be praying to his lucky stars and uh, just hoping that he can find something off the top of the library here. Agreed. And the one thing we notice from Ben's side here is you don't have a castle Vantress. It is crazy how big of an advantage it is oh, yeah. to have a Vantress versus not have it. Now, it is, of course, an advantage to have Wilderness Reclamation compared to not having it as well. But Ben does not have anything to abuse the Wilderness Reclamation right now. No. Chargeable I mean, he, blast zone, yeah, I guess. Yeah, he's got That's blast zone. He could, yeah. he could kill him. Wait, any? Not right now. Yeah. On the turn back, on the on his next turn though, he could kill Uro and the Brazen Borrower. Exactly, but you have to gust the yeah, Uro you have here to just Uro to here. stay alive. I don't know how many cards in Graveyard Patrick has, so it might be a decent plan. But then you still have that four four to deal with as well. Everything's been coming up, Patrick, so far. And honestly, it was all because of that early commence the end game mm -hmm. that has just made Ben blink first, uh, as uh, as the expression goes, and just try to play things that matter to be able to try to deal with okay, it. Okay, what's of that happening four -four. here? 
will win. I don't mean to interrupt you, but what's oh, happening here? Oh no, you're here? fine, yeah. <laughs> so just... He's countering his own spells to get them in the bin to get Uro out. Mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> Excellent play here. Excellent oh, play. I love it. Okay. Be cool, cool. Because look at this alias. That was, I, I caught a quick glance at it. That's five cards in graveyard right now. Yeah. So if we can charge up this blast zone to three, blow yeah. it up, then we can play Uro. All of a sudden, Big, ben would be ahead. Big brain plays there from Ben White, filling up yes. his graveyard with an otherwise useless mystical dispute, paying <laughs> to counter his own spells. It's like he's playing magic with himself, which a lot of uh, control players do like to do. But and uh, wanna, that might keep him alive. It really might. And I want to bring this back to Patrick's play where he didn't play Brazen Borrower into that obvious Ooh. mystical dispute. And now the mystical dispute had to be used on Ben's own spell instead of <laughs> countering the card that's actually killing him right now. Oh my goodness me. Unreal. Brazen Borrower is the draw there for Patrick. We're going to charge up this Blast Zone. We'll be able to kill the Brazen Bar, but there's another one coming. Big draw from Patrick. Uh, that Brazen Bar was huge. It was, but this one is not what you want to see. Sure, Fable Passage gets another card in the graveyard here, though, for Ben. Yeah. We we'll want mean, to fire off this. <sighs> I think if you're Ben, you still have to blow up this Blast Zone. Yeah. And then go Uro, but then he's going to get punished by the second Brazen Bar that was just drawn. Unreal. Unless he can find some way to interact with it off the top of the library when Uro comes back. But let's see here. It all hinges on what Uro Titan Nature's Wrath can find off the top of the library here for Benjamin White. Here's the Blast Zone first. Let's blow up some uh, some brazen borrowers, why don't we? But all right, even Uro. right, even right now, if Patrick does this on the stack, I mean, I would think you'd want to bounce Uro before there's any possibility of negate or something like that. Yeah. Now, of course, this allows Ben to just recast it again, just for yeah. the game life thing. That's gonna be two fresh cards from Ben. This is this is maybe intense. you just maybe you just leave it be. Yeah, oh, that... it's another land off the top of the library. Ben shaking his head. You can see he's not happy with that. The sigh. Oh, That's boy. Game. That is game. And honestly, if he would have taken the line I just suggested, he would have just been able to gain three more life and see another card. Yep. Uh, so great <laughs> play by Patrick. That makes sense why he is there and I'm mm -hmm. up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bounce the end step. Nothing you can do about it. No instant speech shenanigans. Here we go. Patrick Fernandez in with the win. He is still alive wow. in this. And the crowd goes wild. Wow, that was <laughs> wild. Nice final game here. Winner goes on to play Alan Wu. And unfortunately, we got our second person eliminated. We do. We are slowly whittling away at our opponents or at our competitors here. And uh, we are one step closer to finding out who is going to be our champion. Congratulations, Patrick Fernandez. Bad breaks there for Ben Whites, but uh, we still have plenty more Magic Corey right after this break. And keep in mind, Brad Nelson, I mean, he, like you said, he, he took the hard road to the finals, right? Lost immediately and had to win several matches in a row to make it all the way here. Yeah, four in a row just to get in. And now he's got to win two more if he's going to take the trophy, the 100K and the seat of Worlds. Oh, man. <laughs> Brad Nelson just finding the pressure and forcing Glagowski to react to him. That's so important because if you let Piotr just sit here, he will just generate so much advantage to help bear you. Ooh, Mayhem Devil, does that, that do anything? That is big. That's going to do a lot of damage. He's got access to the Fabled Passage, the Witch's Oven. Pyotr Kogowski perhaps on the verge of winning Mythic Championship 7. There goes Nissa, who shakes the world. She's off the battlefield. That's stage number one for Glagowski. Hunter Glagowski has not lost a match in this tournament. He's looking to go end-to-end -end undefeated and hoist the trophy. Brad looks like he's thinking, but he's got this smile on his face. He looks <laughs> over at Canister. <laughs> Canister's <laughs> relaxing with his hand over his head. He's like, you know what? Might be time to pack my swim trunks and get ready for Hawaii. Even Canister has to laugh at this. The rope number two is going down, and Canister says, you know, I'll hang out here. I'm okay with it. <laughs> Brad giving Canister a taste of his own medicine with the thinking emotes. Oh, oh the clock gets even longer. 
He's out of timeouts, by the way. <laughs> yeah, this he's is out of the, the last he's one. Out of Brad has to make a move or that rope is going to get him. And he is going to concede. It is Canister Piotr Glagowski. He is your champion for Mythic Championship 7. Congratulations. Trail of crumbs. How many cards did that draw him? Hey everybody, welcome back to coverage of the Players Tour Finals. Marie Bertholdi, Cedric Phillips, and Riley Knight here with you at our virtual news desk here. And we've had a heck of a morning here, as you would say in Minnesota, here at the Players <laughs> Tour Finals as we work our way through our bracket. Let's take a look at that bracket right now and find out where we've already been this morning, just in case you're joining us, and where we have yet to go still this afternoon. So we've got our upper finals locked with Christoph Prince and Rico Kumagai, and we've just said goodbye to two of our players. Goodbye to Raphael Levy and Ben Weitz. They are eliminated from the tournament. Well fought to both of them. It was an amazing accomplishment to get this far. And Riley, you actually talked to Raph about it. I did. I got the chance to catch up with Raph, of course, everyone's favourite French Hall of Famer. And uh, look, he's in, you know, he's in a bit of a tough spot. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about his performance, about how he felt about it and uh, and sort of where it's left him uh, psychologically. I mean, you know, this, this is a man who's, who's won his fair share against Magic and lost their fair share as well. He said he drew, uh, he thought he drew pretty poorly and his opponents did draw pretty well, but ultimately, um, look, <laughs> I'd like to just read you the uh, the conversation we had here because it is pretty special. <clears throat> I think I played well, he said, so I don't regret anything. And I said, well, last week you said you played badly and look where that got you. Maybe you should have tried that. And he goes, yeah, maybe I should have played like, sh and I can't finish the rest of the sentence because <laughs> interesting to hear his perspective on maybe some of the, you know, the, the post-mortem, the retrospective there from uh, from Raph Levy. But look, you know, uh, nothing risks, nothing gains. And he uh, he did give, give a good account of himself. Unfortunately, the deck didn't really participate. And look, hats off to his opponents who really were able to put a lot of pressure on, on Raph and, and punish his slower draws there. And ultimately, Raph bowing out of the tournament, but still, his head held high. He's done his best, and uh, he's got a pat with the performance he put on, even if it didn't get him to where he perhaps hoped, Maria. Thank you so much, Riley. Well, we've got a lot of stuff to do uh, yet coming up in the show, heading to the lowers in just a little bit. But first, what we're going to do is talk about the top five black cards uh, with popular streamer Nizahan that we saw in this tournament. I'm Neat Tahone, and here are the five most played black cards at the 2020 Players Tour Finals. At number five, it is Priest of Forgotten Gods. The Priest might ask you to give up a couple of creatures, but the price is worth it because what she gives you back is great. She also makes your opponent lose a creature while you draw a card, so you aren't actually going down on cards to use her ability, which also damages the opponent and gives you some mana. She's played in decks that have good sacrifice fodder like Gutter Bones and Dreadhorde Butcher, and sacrifice payoffs like Mayhem Devil, which make the Priest's ability even more formidable. The Priest just turns into an engine in a deck like that. At number 4 it is Woe Strider. This is a nice efficient creature who gives you 3-3 worth of stats for 3 mana, and it's also a creature that doesn't stay dead thanks to Escape. All of that is great and all, but what really pushes the Strider towards being one of the most played cards in this format is having a sacrifice effect that doesn't cost mana. That is perfect for the sacrifice decks, which pair it with cards like Claim the Firstborn and Mayhem Devil. With the Devil in play, every creature you have in play essentially represents a single damage, and that's some incredible reach to have. At number 3 it is Noxious Grasp. Green is such a prevalent color right now that if you're playing black, you should probably have Noxious Grasp in your sideboard. It destroys green or white creatures, or planeswalkers, very efficiently. Among the most important targets in the format that it can kill, there's Nyssa who shakes the world, Joel Rial, and Teferi Time Raveler. You'll be hard pressed to find any deck that is touching black and not running at least one of these somewhere in the 75. At number 2 it is Rotting Regisaur. A 3 mana 7-6 is not something that is easily dealt with. It does come with a big downside, but it puts your opponent under a ton of pressure. The downside can also be mitigated against by discarding things like Woe Strider or Gutter Bones to the effect, and that's exactly what Rakdos decks do in Standard right now. If you're doing that, you're not really giving up a whole card every turn to keep this zombie dinosaur on the battlefield. And at number one, it's Cauldron Familiar. This little cat doesn't stay dead, and that's extra nice when it drains one life every time it enters the battlefield. The Familiar is at its best in Sacrifice decks, which already run a bunch of Sacrifice payoffs, and the food-making Witch's Oven anyway. 
Against aggro decks, the cat can be brought back every turn to block while also draining life. It's an absolute nightmare if you're trying to get in there with an X1 like Blacklands Paragon or Scorch Spitter. Against more controlling decks, the cat and oven combo can give you some reach if your opponent stabilizes. Those were the most played black cards from the 2020 Players Tour Finals. If you want to see more of my top card countdowns, check out my YouTube channel at Nitsahone Magic. Welcome back to the virtual news desk here at the Players Tour Finals. We're going to check in on our bracket so you can find, kind of figure out where we're at in the tournament as we work our way through. And as I'm looking at this bracket here, I just want to kind of get some thoughts from both of you. Cedric, is this turning out at all how you expected? You know, not really. Um, I thought that Raphael Levy, I, I don't want to say he was going to have a smooth path through because there are no smooth paths through when the competition is, is this is this great. But I, I thought things would certainly go better for him today. That's for sure. Um, so that was a little bit surprising to see him get dispatched so quickly. Uh, and I'm also a little bit surprised by Christopher Larson because I just I, I've never been that big of a, of a fan of John Sacrifice. But as Corey Baumeister mentioned, Christopher Larson just keeps playing this deck, keeps winning with this deck, has made it all the way through the top eight. Uh, excuse me, to the top eight. And, you know, he is in the lower bracket right now, but there's still some more magic for him to play. And I don't really know how the matchup goes between him and Michael Jacob, but I'm very excited to find out. Yeah, it's really interesting to see basically all of the predictions from, I guess, some of our experts. All wrong. <laughs> just completely <Yeah>. wrong. <laughs> uh, which just goes to show that, you know, magic is such a great game and you can never actually predict what is going to happen in any given matchup most of the time. Riley, for you, what have been the highlights of your morning so far? You know, look, obviously with a heavy heart, my good mate Raf was uh, was knocked out, but there's still some some familiar faces there that I'm very happy to see battling. Of course, another European superstar in Christopher Larson. I met Chris, geez, 2014 it was when he absolutely stomped me in a GP. Jody did. This was his this was his tech. He was playing mono blue uh, devotion, right? Oh yeah. And uh, his his huge game changing play, right? He was, he had a bout Biden of Thassera, which is like a, a coastal piracy type effect. Draw cards when you hit, hit with creatures. He had another one in his hand. He goes, "Why has no one figured this out? If I've got two Bidens out, I'll draw two cards per." So he plays the second Biden, and he's, I'm like. Mm. Because they're legendary. <laughs> Part of the reason, yeah. I think he was a little, uh, a little uh, sleepy. He hadn't had, hadn't had too much uh, sleep the night before. But uh, look, he did go on to stomp me. But with that oversight, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite aside. But uh, look, he, he's a fierce competitor. He's a huge, big fridge of a man as well, and a very intimidating player to play against. Maybe that, maybe the, his edge, uh, the, the physical presence he has, has taken off, given the fact that we are playing digitally. But I'm pleased to see the Dane up and about, and I think that uh, against Jacob, he's got a decent start. He's got a, he's in a decent spot. I, I spoke with Jacob, as many of you would have seen, and uh, the card to dodge there for Jacob is Mayhem Devil. And of course, we've seen the 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 mayhem that this Devil can wreak on any creature based deck. And so, if Larson can find uh, his Devils and, and take advantage of them, then. He's going to be in a great spot. So whether it's, uh, you know, Larson out of the gates with the Mayhem Devil, whether it's Jacob out of the gates with the Winota, that's certainly going to be a great match to uh, to check out. But of course, still so much more to look, look forward to around our top eight. Absolutely. We've sent two people home already last round. And guess what? We've got two more people to send home coming up here in round number two of our lowers. Let's find out who we're going to watch for in the lowers round number two. That's right, Christopher Larson versus Michael Jacobs. So you're wondering how this match turns out. You're about to find out. John Sacrifice versus Mardu Winota. Let's peek at Christopher Larson's John Sacrifice list that he brought to this tournament that a lot of people said, what? That's spelled W-U-T. What? Uh, <laughs> Cedric, uh, talk me through this. Like, how does he keep winning? I mean, it's still a powerful deck. You know, the sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice synergies with the deck and, and the food synergies with the deck are, are still powerful. And Mayhem Devil, especially uh, plural, when sacrifice things are going on, it is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So, you know, from a power level perspective, this deck can certainly win. And it is better, in my opinion, against creature decks as opposed to non-creature decks, like your Wilderness Reclamation strategies. But, you know, if I look at things here, as, as Michael Jacob mentioned, as 
as Riley mentioned, Mayhem Devil's the key card in this particular matchup. Uh, if Christopher Larson's able to find that, he'll be able to contain Michael Jacobs' battlefield, and then Jacob will not be, ever be able to have those big Winota turns. But if he's not, you know, a card like Claim the Firstborn, not great in this matchup. A card like Priest of Forgotten Gods, not that great in this matchup when you're playing against a deck that has raised the alarm and other ways to generate tokens. So some of Christopher Larson's ways of containing creatures, not ideal here. The best way for him to do so is with Mayhem Devil. So he's got to find that card. And if he does, Jacob doesn't have a great way to get it off the battlefield and it will just run rampant all over the game. Well, let's see what Michael Jacob's working with here. Uh, so, you know, just to take a peek at how his deck's going to stack up against this Jun deck. What does Michael Jacob need to do? Basically what he's doing all the time, same game plan, Cedric? Yeah, I mean, I, I, when you're playing a deck like this, I call it a people strategy because your deck is just all people, just people all the time. <laughs> Even raise the alarm, make two people, your turn. Um, he's got to make a lot of people and then attack with some people and generate some more people. That's what his deck does. Now, as you'll see, because his deck is all people, there's no removal. So if Mayhem Devil's on the battlefield, those people are going to die. And we don't want to see the people die if we're rooting for Marty Winona. So... I, to make this as kind of clear cut and as simple as I can, for Michael Jacob, just as he said during his little chit chat with Riley, Fade Mayhem Devil, which that is like a weird thing to say as far as a strategy is concerned, because you don't really have over any control over that. But look, sometimes your, your opponent doesn't draw the right card. So it's just a little a little bob and weave, a little fade here, the Mayhem Devil. And if 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 uh, if Larson doesn't draw that card, I actually think the games are pretty easy for MJ. You know, you're calling it a people deck, Cedric, but I thought you called this deck Knuckleheads deck. Is this not a Knucklehead? Uh, I mean, it's got, deck? I would call the mono white aggro deck with all this, those terrible one drops, more of Knuckleheads. Uh, this is, you know, I, I, I throw these terms around uh, all in fun, but this is, this is just mono. This is a mono people strategy here. A lot of humans, <laughs> just people everywhere. Riley, who do you like to win this match? Again, look, I think if Larson can find that key card, it really is the the, the linchpin upon uh, which he will build his entire strategy here. If he can't find that the, the card Mayhem Devil, he's going to be in a world of pain. But look, I spoke to Jacob. He said that, you know, the spin to win strategy has been good to him over the years, you know, with both Etherworks Marvel and, and what he's playing now. But sometimes you just brick. Sometimes you just brick. And sometimes Winota just loses to itself. Even in the days of Agent of Treachery, Winota sometimes just didn't put up the rock. And as a result, you know, Larson is right in this if, if, the, if the Winds of Fortune are at his back. So we will see. I do think that uh, MJ has the edge here. But again, I'm loath to make predictions because we've been wrong at basically every turn today. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, let's keep it coming. Cedric, let's hear a wrong prediction. Let's go. <laughs> uh, I, well, actually, I take uh, I take offense. I got my last prediction right. I said MJ would beat Raph. And I'm picking MJ again. Uh, he's going to fade. Going to fade the mayhem devil just enough to be able to win this one and move on all right well round two of our lowers is coming up in just a couple of minutes two more people going home don't go anywhere and this makes it so that sure. it's going to be harder for reed to win just through flyers alone exactly it also means that cards like exclusion major are no longer lethal uh, you know right away right so now Reed's going to have to look for an entrancing melody or an additional copy of something like a miscloaked herald to get back in. But he doesn't have a lot more draw steps left because Autumn is getting close to the point where they can start attacking with that Tempest Gin. It's seven power. Yeah. That would be an attack for 10. It's a Merfolk Trickster. Is this actually lethal? This is an aggressive trickster. Well, it might be lethal. Right. Two, th three, f three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus seven. That is 12 damage. However, Reed does have a blocker in the Merfolk Trickster, right? So the Tempest Shin will get in for seven. The Merfolk Trickster can block. It doesn't look like a lethal attack unless Autumn has something else. Those are the two new creatures there that Autumn's just pulled down. Seven. Seven. It is a lethal 10, attack. 12. It yeah. is a lethal it attack. It is. That's just lethal. And that's going to wow. do it. Autumn Burchett moves on to the finals, defeating Reed Duke three games to one. We knew Mono Blue was going to be in the finals. We did not know who was going to be piloting it. And take a look at the reaction from Autumn. Pure elation. And Reed Duke, gracious in defeat as well. But wow. Reed, I mean, putting up that fight, though, on a mulligan to five, 
And it looked like he was pretty well ahead, actually. Yes. It was those two Essence captures at just the right time from right. Autumn Essence, to save the game. Essence captures just doing a ton of work there. Yeah. Wow. And welcome back to Cover 